Halleluja. Halleluja. This is a time of rejoicing. And I am very, very happy to be here at the feast. And it's, uh, it's so fitting how we ended with that, um, that song, I Love Your Presence, because that, <laughs> it's in the message. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I, um, the Feast of Tabernacles, right? This doesn't, this, there's another name for that, right? It's uh, the Feast of Ingathering. The Feast of Tabernacles is also known as the Feast of Ingathering. So, so what is being gathered here, right? The, the, the Feast of Tabernacles happens around the full harvest season, right? And because we live in the northern hemisphere, just like the Holy Land, Israel, this is also our harvest season, right? So what is being harvested? I mean, just look around me, right? What is being harvested? You see pumpkins? I think that's what, yeah, pumpkin. You see corn, uh, apples, Different kinds of fruit are being harvested this season. So there were, when we were in the feast in New York last year, we went to an apple orchard and we really enjoyed ourselves there. There were plenty of apples and you could just pick them right off the trees and eat them. We also got plenty of peppers too. So it's in Exodus 34 and verse 22 where Yahweh calls this feast commonly called the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Ingathering. It happens at the turn of the year, so that is as the year is heading towards its end. The only feast in the year after the Feast of Ingathering is the eighth day of the last great day. So Exodus 34, 22 says, You shall observe the Feast of Weeks, the first fruits of wheat harvest, and the Feast of Ingathering at the turn of the year. Now, it's quite likely that you've seen farmers' markets around. You know, because farmers are harvesting their fruits and now they're selling it. So the fresh fruits and vegetables that you see on the stands were gathered by farmers during this season. This is a harvest season. To harvest is to gather in, to bring in the fruits and vegetables from the land. So that's why this feast is also called the Feast of Ingathering. Now, farmers plant seeds at different times of the, of the year for different Crops. Now, um, I'm going to go into like f- some farming terminology here and plant. Now, I'm not a farmer, but I'd like to be. So, but we we'll, we we'll talk about planting, watering, and harvesting. So, some plants or crops take a longer time to mature than others. Others take it, take a shorter time. So, it is at the maturity of the crops that they are harvested. When the crops are ready to be harvested, so you can't plant something that takes three, four months to, to grow and then trying to harvest it tomorrow or two weeks from now. It, it won't be ready. So it's at the time of maturity that all those um, crops or plants are harvested. So the farmer sows seeds into the soil with hopes that the seed will germinate and grow into whatever kind of plant or grain or vegetable that the farmer wants, right? So now... What does this mean for us as believers? Okay, we, we know that all the crops, the vegetables, the grains, and plants are harvested during this season. Different crops are harvested during different times of the year, but we're going to focus on harvesting of the crops in this particular season, the fall season. So different kinds of seeds are planted at different times of the year, and the seeds will germinate and grow into the specific plant, vegetable, that the farmer wants. But the goal of the farmer is that by the time the fall season arrives, all the crops are ready to be harvested, right? All the crops are ready to be harvested. So no matter what time of year the seed was planted, the goal of the farmer is to have that plant, whatever it is, ready. And some of the plants or um, crops that are harvested during this particular season are apples, potatoes, pumpkins, pomegranates, peppers, onions, and pears. So whatever it is, They are planted at different times of the year, but by this particular season, they have to be ready to be harvested. So, of course, apples are trees, and they take years to grow and be ready to produce fruit. But the trees are still pruned and taken care of by the farmer so that they produce the best fruit at the time of ingathering, at the time of the harvest. Some crops are planted in early spring. 
some in the late spring, some in the summer. But the farmer expects the crop to be ready to be harvested by the time of the harvest. So even for us as believers, no matter what time in our lives we heard and believed the gospel, whether we were really young in our 20s or 30s or even later than that, by the time the harvest comes, we should be ready to be harvested. So now, we're going to talk about planting and harvesting. So let, let's picture in our minds a farmer planting seeds, right? The farmer will water the seeds through the soil, take care of the soil and the seeds, and hope that the seeds will grow into a specific crop and be ready to be harvested at harvest time. So we'll look at the Feast of Ingathering from a spiritual point of view. So who is the farmer who plants the seeds? Now, now, now before you run to the, the parable of the sower, it's... It's not exactly the same. It's similar, but not exactly the, the same. So, so who is the farmer that is planting the seeds? What are the, any guesses? Yeshua, yes. The farmer is Yeshua. He has the seeds and plants them. The farmer has a vast land with all kinds of crops and vegetables on that land. He has made the soil ready. And he knows the soil is good enough for the seeds to grow. Now this farmer, this farmer is an expert farmer. He knows exactly what each crop needs to grow. Now, for this seed to grow, it needs water and an environment good enough for it to germinate. That is to, to sprout. To, to germinate is when the seed starts to, to grow. You know. So without water and an environment good enough for it to germinate, that is to come to life, it cannot grow. A seed is pretty much dead, right? A seed is, is dead. A seed alone is dead. A seed by itself does not produce fruit or any benefit to the farmer. It does nothing. Some seeds can be eaten, but that's it. Once eaten, they're gone. But it's the farmer's goal to get that seed to grow into the fruit or vegetable that he wants it to. He chose that seed and has a purpose for that seed. In fact, on this farmer's land, all the seeds are planted, all of them. Not one of the seeds is not planted. So then, in our story, who or what is the seed? What is the seed? The seeds, yes, it's us. It's unbelievers. The seeds refer to unbelievers. The seeds are dead. They do not grow on their own. They are lifeless. A seed cannot germinate by itself. It can't. Now, this farmer has a very large farm. His land is vast. All the seeds on his farm are planted into this land waiting for the harvest. So what does the land refer to then? If unbelievers are the seeds, what is the land? This vast land where all the seeds are planted. What is the land? The world, yes, the land is the earth. The farmer has the land. That means Yeshua owns the earth. All the seeds are his, and all the seeds are planted into this land. Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is Yahweh's, and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell with therein. So the whole earth belongs to Yahweh, all of it and everything in it. We know Yeshua is Yahweh come as a savior, so the earth and everything in it belongs to Yahweh. In our story here, the farmer, the land, the seeds, and everything on that land belong to the farmer. The farmer is Yahweh. The farmer can do whatever he wants with the land. So, so the farmer loves the seeds. He wants the seeds to grow into beautiful, lovely fruits and vegetables with all sorts of bright colors, giving off wonderful tastes, right? Now, other than soil and air, what does the seed need in order to germinate? Without this, the seed remains dead. It's, it's, it's water, right? Sunlight too, yes. But the seed is still in the soil, so it needs water first to germinate. The seed needs water. Soil, usually, and water, which is extremely important. Without water, the seed cannot germinate. It's still dead. So, in our little story here, the seed is the unbeliever. What then is the water? The water is, 
is the word or the gospel. The gospel brings life to the unbeliever just like water brings life to the seeds. In Isaiah 12 verse 3, Yahweh is speaking to Isaiah telling him what it will be like when Yeshua comes to rule the earth. And he says, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Yeshua brings water that brings salvation. Water that brings eternal life. When speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well, what did Yeshua say? Yeshua answered, if you knew the gift of Elohim and who is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you what? Living water. Living water. So in, in John chapter 7, it is recorded that Yeshua is, is at a particular feast. What feast is this? Because it says in John 7, 37, it says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Yeshua stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. What feast is that? The feast where there's a last great day at the end. It's tabernacle, right? It is this same feast that we are keeping. The same feast we are attending almost 2,000 years later. So the water is living water. This water leads to eternal life. The water is the gospel. The gospel is living water that leads to salvation. Paul in Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek or the Gentile. Okay, so, so going back to our analogy of the seeds being planted so they can be harvested as, as crops, the water is the gospel. So, some of the seeds accept the water, but other seeds actually reject the water. The seeds remain dead. They think they are alive because of the warmth of the soil. You know, soil is, is warm. So these, these are the pleasures of the world or because they feel the water passing by them, but they never let the water enter into them to cause them to grow and change. They feel the water, but they never let the water change them. Now, for the seeds to grow, that is for them to be changed, they have to continue to drink the water, right? And accept everything that the farmer is giving them. They will grow into exactly what the farmer wants them to grow, to the glory of the farmer. You see, the, in this harvest time, the goal of the farmer is that each seed continues to grow and prosper until harvest time. The harvest time is extremely important because if a crop is not ready to be harvested by that time, it shall not be harvested. So the seed must continue to grow. But there's a period, right? There's a, there's a period between when the seed is planted and when the seeds are harvested. So in our analogy here, the seeds are all the human beings on the earth, all of them. The farmer, Yeshua, plants them because it is Yeshua that creates all human beings. All seeds are planted. He then waters them. He waters all the seeds. The gospel is preached to every single human being. To those who have never heard of the name Yeshua, the gospel is still preached to them in a way that they have to decide whether to have faith and believe in Yeshua or reject him completely. No one will be with excuse. No one. So then, the water is given to all the seeds. Some of the seeds accept the water and begin to grow and change, but some seeds, they reject the water. They like the warmth of the soil. In the soil there, they see all kinds of bugs and worms, and they are mesmerized by them. The soil is entertaining. It is nice and warm. In the soil, they don't have to do very much. They just have to sit there and enjoy everything that the farmer created. They see the worms passing by, and they are entertained. Huh? They see all kinds of creatures in the soil. They like to watch the soil and be merry. Do we understand the analogy here? We say that the land is the earth or the world. The soil is that land. The land is the world. The world offers so much in the way of entertainment and pleasures. You can have money and love and everything you want. You can become this and become that. You can chase after money and chase after romance, chase after love, enjoy drugs. You only live once, right? So live it up, right? But the soil, the land, can never give you water that can make you grow to become the 
crop that the farmer wants you to become. It can never do that. The water will get inside you and do wonders. See, the seed germinates and pierces the ground and starts to grow and grow and grow. That in itself is a miracle. The seeds that reject the water, they never become alive and grow. They stay in the soil, lifeless, dead. At harvest time, when the farmer sends his workers to harvest the plants, the workers who are Yahweh's holy angels harvest only the plants that are alive. Later, the farmer will create a brand new farm, the most beautiful farm ever seen. It will have amazing colors and just be gorgeous. That's the whole new farm. The other farm will be done away with. And all the seeds that refused the water that brings life will be cast away into a fiery furnace and burnt. We understand that analogy, right? I don't have to explain that analogy, right? Those seeds are those who reject the water that brings life to that is the gospel of salvation. The new farm is the new heaven and the new earth, and it will be very beautiful. So now, from germination until harvest time, we, we talked about seeds that accept the farmer's water and grow, right? Those are unbelievers who receive the gospel and come alive and be born again, like us. So they grow into the crop that the farmer wants. Now, those plants and vegetables must continue to accept what the farmer gives them in order for them to grow. The farmer owns the seeds. The farmer loves the seeds very much. So after planting and watering the seeds, the seed starts to grow. The farmer must now prune the plants. You know what pruning is, right? Pruning is when you cut away parts of the plant in order to make the plant flourish and grow better. So the farmer prunes and each and every plant, cutting the parts of the plant that are preventing the plant from flourishing. The cutting doesn't feel good to the plant, but it is necessary if the plant is to become what the farmer wants it to become, right? We know what this means, right? The farmer's goal is to make sure that every plant reaches the time of ingathering, the time of harvest. That's his goal. So the farmer works very hard on each and every plant. He knows each and every plant individually. He knows each plant so well that he has names for each plant. See, most farmers don't know that. Most farmers just plant their seeds, but this farmer knows each and every plant well, so he even names them. He's a master farmer. Master farmer, right? He has names for each and every stalk of corn, for each and every apple tree, for each and every herb. He knows them by name. Your father in heaven knows you by name. Not by the name as in the name you were given by your parents or your guardians, but he knows your very character, your very soul, your very being. He knows you like that. The farmer must do this work if these plants will be ready for the great harvest, for the ingathering. But you see... The plants can refuse everything that the master farmer is trying to do to them. The plants can first start to refuse the pruning that must be done. The pruning is Yeshua taking away all the things that are a distraction between your fellowship with him. Yeshua will cut things away in order to make you grow into what he desires. You see, if he sees that one of your branches, right, one of your branches is starting to get long and he wants to t hold on to the harmful substances that could harm you, Yeshua could uproot the entire plant and plant it in a different part of, of the farm so that the tree does not get distracted. The analogy here is that Yeshua will do all that is necessary in order for you to grow right. He may even move you away from a place that you're comfortable he will move you from your family or from your job that is comfortable to a different place if where you are now is harmful for your growth. But even though Yeshua does this, he doesn't force the plants to do any of these things. The farmer knows the seeds because he created them. And so he's actually able to communicate with them. 
the farmer doesn't force the plants to take the water or any of the nutrients he gives them. Just like some seeds refuse the water that brings life, some seeds can refuse, uh, some plants can refuse the water, the nutrients, or the pruning that must be done. But what happens to a plant that refuses water, nutrients, and pruning? Now, I know any of, not, I don't think any of us here are farmers, but what happens to a plant, let's say, if it stops getting sunlight, right? It will, it starts to get sick, and it will eventually die. I learned, I think it was in seventh grade, that um, plants need nitrates, and if they don't have them, they become yellow. So if a plant doesn't get all that it needs from the farmer, it starts to wilt, and it's going to get sick, and then it eventually die. So even for us, if we start to refuse the farmer's care, we will become spiritually sick, we will eventually die. Now plants, plants can start to, to think they don't need the farmer's care, right? Plants can grow into beautiful trees with colorful blossoming flowers and delicious fruit. They start to think, well, you know what? They made themselves this way, right? The tree can say, you know, I'm beautiful because of me. I made me like this. They can become proud, you know? And as believers, we may start to think, you know what? We don't need Yeshua's guidance anymore, right? I'm wise enough. All the singing, the preaching, all these gifts, it's not from Yeshua. It's from us. We can start to become proud and to think like that. But if we start to think like that, if the plants stop receiving the care from the farmer, they start to wilt, then they start to die. We need to be humble. We need to be humble. We need to be humble. We need to kill the pride. We need to surrender and let the farmer do his work. The harvest that you see here is because the farmer did his work. And now you can see the fruit. We need to surrender and let the farmer do the work. So let the farmer prune us. Let him cut away what needs to be cut. Let him move us where he desires that we move. Let him take away what needs to be taken away. So that at the time of in gathering, at the time of harvest, we are ready. Let him do his work. Let Yeshua do his work on you, on us. Stop resisting the farmer. Stop resisting the work of Yeshua. Let us stop wanting to do our own things and let the farmer do what he desires in us. He knows how beautiful we can be in his father's eyes. He knows how wonderful we shall be to his farmer because the farmer has the whole farm and does all the work for his father. So stop doing what you want to do and do instead what Yahweh wants you to do. Stop putting things off because you are scared. Fear is not from Yahweh. Fear is a sin because it is a lack of faith. Don't start doing Yahweh's work and then you stop. You should continue. Continue in the work. If you start to feel tired and overwhelmed, cry out to Yahweh, pray to Yahweh, and ask him to give you strength. Stop doing what you want to do. Stop putting Yahweh second. Stop giving Yahweh only the things that you are comfortable giving him, holding back the thing that you really want to hold on. Give him everything. Be all in. Humble yourself and let the master do the work on you. You, you see, saints, the goal is for us to make it to this time, to harvest time. The goal is for us to grow and be ready for when the harvest, when Yeshua comes and gathers us in, the in-gathering. If we are not ready by then, we will not be gathered in. I am saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved, right? We must continue, continue, and continue. So now, how do we do this continuing? How do we continue on this path of spiritual growth until harvest time, until Yeshua returns? When Yeshua went to heaven, who did he send to earth to be with us? Yes. He sent the Holy Spirit, the beautiful, amazing Holy Spirit. We just sang, right, what, I love your presence, right? What did Yahweh say in, 
Ezekiel 36 and verse 27. It said, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So what does that mean? I will put my spirit within you. What is the name of this feast? Tabernacles, right? Yes. So when Yahweh says, speaking of the new covenant, I will put my spirit within you. What is he saying? I will come and tabernacle with you. Yahweh is saying, I will come and tabernacle with you in the temple that Solomon built. The Holy Spirit was there, right? The presence of Yahweh was there in the Holy of Holies, right? The presence of Yahweh at the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies is the Holy Spirit. Now, the temple was a tabernacle, right? The, the only difference, the only basic difference between the tabernacle and the temple is that the tabernacle moved. It moved around. But the temple was fixed, right? The presence of Yahweh was there. The Holy Spirit was there. The temple was the tabernacle of Yahweh. Yahweh placed his spirit within you and is tabernacling with you. That's why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6.19, Or oh, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, with whom you have from God? You are not your own. Your body is a temple, a tabernacle for Yahweh to dwell in. Yahweh is tabernacling, dwelling with you. When one of the prophecies was made of Yeshua, it said, Therefore, Adonai himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, right? What does Emmanuel mean? Elohim with us. Yahweh has made his dwelling with us. He has made us his tabernacle. His tabernacle. We have been made into his, his tabernacle. So our goal as saints is to make it to the harvest, to the ingathering, right? So how do we do that? In John 14 and verse 23, Yeshua answered him and said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him, right? If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. If we love the farmer, Yeshua, we will keep his word, and the farmer will love, and the father will love us, and they will come and make their home with us. They will come and tabernacle with us. When you tabernacle with someone, you get to know them better. Sister Denise mentioned this that when we go away to the feast, we tabernacle with the saints, and we get to know them better. Last year, I tabernacled with Brother Will, and I got to know him better. When we keep Yahweh's word, he comes to tabernacle with us and we get to know him better. We get to know him more and more. As we continue to tabernacle with him, we will know him more and more. If you're living at home with somebody, you, you get to know them more and more. We get closer and closer and the relationship becomes sweeter and sweeter. We become more intimate with him. We know him more and more. So when he returns, he will never say, I never knew you would depart from me. He won't. You, do you know why? Because we tabernacled with him. We kept his commandments and he made his home within us. And we continued to tabernacle with him. The reason why tabernacle is seven days is because seven means completion. And we're supposed to tabernacle with him until the end of our days. Or until the end of the age, until the harvest time. So we continue to tabernacle with him. When that time comes, this temporary tabernacle is transformed into the glorious tabernacle that looks like Yeshua. So keep his word so that he continues to tabernacle with you until the harvest comes. May Yahweh bless you all.